welcome back to New Comic Book Day Night Live. My name is Eli Schwab, and we are joined by two amazing hosts, Manny Gomez, Rick Lopez, and our two amazing guests, Brandon Graham and Marty Keen. What's up, everyone? All right. We're back. We're back in action. All right. So as this is New Comic Book Day, we're going to talk a little bit about the new books we got either today, this month. They don't have to be brand new books, but they can be new books. And then we're going to dive in to the careers and comics of our two creators here today. All right. So we are going to start with Rick Lopez. What'd you get? And what kind of questions do you have for the hosts or for the guests? <laughs> comics wise? I don't know, dude. I don't think I got anything crazy. I mean, I got a, I got this Mythic Legion in recently. But it's a fucking horse. It's a pretty articulated horse, so that'll horse. come in handy. That'll come yeah. in handy for comics, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't get any new comics this week. Um, I definitely have a million questions for Brandon and Maddie. I have so many fucking questions. <laughs> but um, yeah, dude, uh, I'm still I'm still pumping the power. Uh, issue one, issue two, I have those still. I'm just about to get ready to color the third issue of the power. Uh, I'm finishing up this uh, commission for somebody else's book that I'm really excited to show. I'm actually coloring like the, I'm in the very last bit of uh, coloring that that person's pages. Um, on top of that, on Next Panel Press, I do Cosmic Cat. I've done about, I think, 57 strips in the main storyline. I do a, a strip every other weekend. So, I mean, that's like for anybody out there, really, like I, people like when I do these art walks, like the, they'll be like kids and stuff because their parents will come. I'm like, if you do like even a page a week, like you're going to have like two books at the end of the year. So, yeah. I mean, you know, or you, or you could have more just multiples of four, you know, that sort of thing. And then like speaking to kids, I did the cover for Jerome's uh, kid friendly black and white all ages fight comic uh, tree versus Fox did an homage to Dark Knight Returns. I got a few of those copies and I've been remarking them, but this is the one I was keeping. And then I'm still pumping uh, Ghost Agents. I have a few of those, but I know at ghostagents.net, you could you could grab those there and it's filled with filled to the brim with a ton of like amazing artists covered by Barry Tan. It's got Chris Anderson in there. It's got Misimo, John Burkett, whole bunch of people in there. But yeah, that one's really great. And then I've been giving out like prints of my uh of my page from that one but yeah that's just that's as far as like new comic stuff goes for me just been trying to work and keep my head down you know you blur the lines between plugs and new comics which is good. yeah i, meant to start I do what i want to get is tales from the wolf that's the one i've been eyeing and then i saw you made a post that there's five left i'm like okay i need to pull the trigger on that today yes yeah i'll save one for you bud please do yeah that was something yeah, that came into my head too. as far as books Looks wise. Word, man. Yeah. All right. So let's let's go around the horn then and we'll do the opening plugs and uh we'll do the new new books and then we'll get into questions. All right. So Manny, what'd you get this week? Well, it was a pretty good week. I got um I got the new issue of Love and Rockets that came out. So that's always a nice surprise because you I never know when it's coming out. So you know it, it's you know it's kind of kind of like an irregular schedule. So it's always a nice surprise. Uh I got Dr. Atomic, the pipe and dope book that Image put out, um, uh, you know, through like Shadowline, which is Jim Valentino's uh, imprint at Image. Mm -hmm. And um, it's cool. It's, it's like a how-to guide for smoking weed and the history of weed. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, whether you like to smoke weed or not, I think it's a good comic book. Got <laughs> the new issue of Nightwing, uh, Gunslinger Spawn, which I keep buying and I don't know why. I guess I just have this weird affinity for Spawn, and I like getting the books. And then I picked up Warlock Rebirth because I'm a big Adam Warlock fan. Oh, didn't so, see that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, all in all, a pretty decent week. Uh, you know, um, about five or six books. I've been averaging that many every week. So, always something to read at. Um, as far as like what I've been working on, uh, still, uh, you know, doing the weekly episodes with Ryan on the Comic Lounge where we do our weekly picks, but. Uh, we also have a couple of cool, like, sort of standalone episodes coming up. We're going through Preacher, volume by volume, so those will be coming out soon. Uh, we interviewed Eric Larson. Uh, that should be up uh, sometime soon, too. We did that last week. That was a lot of fun. And uh, we're also doing, uh, speaking of, uh, we were, we're doing a 
issue by issue uh, analysis uh, look through of uh, Rob Liefeld's like uh, New Mutants run, you know, starting with his first one. And um, yeah, I'm also working on Relic Hunter with Adam. I'm uh, co-writing the uh, second issue with him. And uh, I also have a backup story I wrote that's going to be in issue one that uh, that is, uh, you know, illustrated by the man himself right there, Rick Lopez. So yeah, that, that's exclusive. That's exclusive right now. Yeah. Uh, going to also be released by Cosmic Lion Productions it's very, very yeah. soon. Very exciting, man. And uh, the stuff I've seen has been mind blowing, you know. So mind blowing that when I look at it, I forget that I that I'm even involved. In it. <laughs> you know, it just like, it is, seems so real. Yeah, man. Yeah, Rick's done some amazing stuff. Yeah, and then I'm writing for Monkeys Fighting Robots, where I do like uh, you know uh, various interviews, and uh, I do reviews for the Comics Beat uh, every week. So you know, I got I got a couple of things going. I try to stay busy. Hell yeah. All right. I got a couple new books. Of course, the Turtles vs. Usagi. You gotta you gotta read that. Yeah. The classic team in Stan Sakai for real is one of the greatest cartoonists alive. An amazing yep. nice person that I've just run across at cons. And you know, I wouldn't I just read everything that he puts out and the fact that it's those turtle ninjas I love so much is perfect. One of the best letters as well, I think. Oh, yeah. He's the letterer of Gru. Yeah. And I think he also lettered the Spider-Man uh, comic strip for a while. Really? I think so. All right. Now, I also got this uh, Kickstarter uh, in that was uh, by Kankor. It was Kankor, and he did, there's like a vinyl record. Jack the Radio also came with it. Uh, amazing art in this one um, by a ton of people, including our guest today, Brandon Graham. Uh, and there's this also uh, an anthology that comes with it. And um, of course, Cosmic Lion Productions. Uh, we've got new books coming out. I spent all day and all night last night putting together um, another rehash of my own work. Uh, uh, just putting together some old comics and stuff. Uh, that'll be available at Heroes Con as well as Relic Hunter and uh, a special Kevin Anthony Catalan uh, preview of issue two of Space Knights. Oh, that's, I'm so excited for that. Yeah, it's going to be sick. All right, so shout out to our guests, Dr. B and Jabba Juju. What up, dude? What up, Ryan? Welcome, guys. Oh, yeah, I got to ask to unmute. Yo, so. what up? Oh, what up? <laughs> All right, cool. So now we're going to start. Hey, into... no. <laughs> what up, Ryan? Good to see you, dude. Um, all right, so we're going to go into the questions portion. Let's go back up here to Rick, uh, who's got many questions, but we'll start with his first one. Uh, I'll start with Madi. I'm, uh, thank you again, man. I'm su super excited for you to come on. Thank you for your time so much. Really stoked that we could uh, get this all started. But um, I, I, I feel like this is right. Um, let me just let me just start this off. But like you're the whole making comics that's still relatively uh new to you right like it's only been a few years right yeah yeah exactly okay same, okay pretty much same thing here that's that's really what i wanted to hear about i wanted to hear about like what sparked it you know because i know it's got to be like like for me for sure same thing so it's like what was the there had to have been some big event you know or something that where you're like you know what? i'm tired of waiting on somebody or whatever it was like i'm just gonna fucking do this shit myself I'm like how did that all go you know so um before actually making comics i drew all of my life but i was just kind right. of more of a hobby uh, i was pursuing music before and so i was gigging doing the rock and roll show you know you can see i got some you know my scraps and stuff back oh, there. okay yeah. i was doing that and i was you know making my way up the ladder doing residencies and whatnot but then covid uh kind of took all the gigs away and so then like a lot of us i was just kind of left to my own device not knowing what to do and then I just remembered that I loved comics. It was like I had put it in the back of my mind for so long. I hadn't read comics in so long. And then I uh, I just started drawing again. And then before I knew it, I was just launched into a comics, uh, kind of indie comics career. And I just, I went full on because I, I fell in love with it right away. So that's that's how I got my start. Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome, dude. Because like... Um... I remember when the like the bootleg Spider-Man, obviously that was like a really big hit, you know, and everything. 
like when we did uh when we did image grand design and they shared that video i remember waking up and it was like i had like no like more notifications than i've ever had in my life you know it was fucking crazy so like how was that experience like for you i i'm sure it was even more crazy with just like you know what i mean like all the eyes on you like that had to have been so awesome you know i mean it was funny because when the episode dropped i was at i was at my day job i was you know serving coffee for the for the masses so i had my phone on vibrate <laughs> And the whole day, it was just whoop, 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 throughout my leg. So I, was, I couldn't check it because I was on the floor, you know, serving espresso. But, uh, but it, I mean, it was crazy. It was kind of surreal. You know what I mean, because I had right, done, totally. you know, I just done it like that because it was kind of a fun, a fun little side project in between my, my regular series. And, um, and to have something that I just did, you know, on the side sort of blow up in that way was, was a lot of, you know, it was very surreal. Super, pretty surreal no i mean that's super that's super exciting man like totally i'm i hope it brought like tons of eyes to your to your book you know like to your actual book you know yeah oh yeah for sure it's <laughs> no, like that that's sick K-Fabe, dude yeah the kayfabe channel for sure uh shed a lot of light on my work and since then I've, I've gotten i've been able to kind of do more and more with my comics which is just a dream you know that's all good that's fucking awesome dude i'm really glad to hear that man but I'll I'll save my next couple questions. Um, but yeah, I'll shoot off to ne- to probably Manny or Eli. Thanks, thanks so much though for now. Oh, good. thanks so much, dude. I mean, I was wondering all that stuff too. But let's go over to Manny. Uh, next question, throw it out to anyone. Um, I guess uh, I'll 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 you know I'll go with Marty. I mean, um, as as far as like um uh, you know coming up with bootleg spider-man where where did that come from i mean like um love for the character like i mean because and and uh were you already working on steel streets when you when you did that yeah i think i had i had been uh working on issue four of steel streets and um in between there i went to baltimore comic-con and i know serendipitously there was somebody asked me for a spider-man commission and then I was drawing my Spider-Man and then some other guy saw it and then he wanted a commission. And so I kept drawing Spider-Man the whole weekend. And then I came back home and I had kind of like a Spider-Man binge. You know, I was like a frenzy. I went through all the Ditko's, all the McFarlane. Right. Like, oh, Spider-Man. And then I just kind of, uh, I went, uh, I think I posted on the Kayfabe group, uh, a black and white Spidey, just saying, uh, oh, Marvel, can you please let me uh, do a Spider-Man? Ha ha. And then some guy just said, do a bootleg. And I was like, 100%, why didn't I think of that? And so I did. And then it, it all happened kind of quick because uh, I think within five five days or something like that, I had the, I had the book done. And, so you, uh, you, you did it, you actually, from start to finish, it was about five days that you did that? It took five, yeah, it was about five days. Because I was kind of hitting a That's road. That's pretty block. impressive. I mean, the thing is, it's so, it was just, it's joke after joke. So I was just having a good time. I was laughing, at, you know, to myself in my room. And I, was kind of, I didn't see the time go by, but. Um, so it's like you were doing it for your, kind of you were doing it for yourself almost too, in a, in a way like. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was sending pages to my, to my brother, just making him laugh. And then he was like, oh, where's it going next? Where's it going next? You know, we're chatting and stuff. It was really just and, and did you like have a plan for it when you started off or were you just like putting pen to paper and just going with it like yeah i i like to say that i i marvel method myself when i write <laughs> you know what i mean so i just kind of i just start you know top what is it top uh, left to bottom right and then i draw the thing as i'm thinking about it then i write the page and then the next page is just sort of the continuation of the, of the and then somehow it all kind of melts together in a way but it's basically yeah it's page by page panel by panel usually now I would imagine with Steel Streets you could probably have a different approach, right? I mean, because that—that's you would imagine that, but surprisingly so. It's kind of all uh... <laughs> really shoot from the hip. You know what I mean? Shoot from the hip. So you don't do a lot of scripting or anything. You just kind of start drawing. Yeah, I, I just I I try sometimes to do um, thumbnailing and and stuff like that, but it, it doesn't seem to work for me. I I I think it was Jack Kirby. He said that, or one of the Busemas said, uh, if you want to be fast to throw away the, the eraser, is that, is that kind of a... I think he I've never heard that, but that's a great quote. That's what he said, yeah. It's kind of, it's, don't think about it too much. And then, you know, I just try to have as much fun as I can. And then, and then you know, you, as you keep going like that, you sort of, 
you know, yet then you start having issues in the back that you can work with. And it's easier to go into the past and pick and choose elements that will work in the future. So you can say like, oh, I want to bring that back. Or I want to, I want it to tie into this. So I want to think. So as you build it, you get more and more to work with. I find that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Word. That's all a crazy way to work. I, could, I actually, I got some Spider-Man questions. If it's cool if I jump in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude. yeah I, I wonder, Matt, did you got a, is there a, is there like a peak Spider-Man for you? Cause, cause I'm a big Spider-Man fan, but it, there's a wall I hit where I just, I don't read much past the eighties. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I think the last Spider-Man I followed was, I think Romita in the, in the nineties or early two thousands. Oh yeah. The Romita junior when he's doing, who was the writer? was the Babylon five writer on that. I think. Jay, Michael, Jay Michael Straczynski. Yeah. 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 That was good. Yeah, stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I think that was the last Spider-Man I, I was, uh, I was following for sure, but I think yeah, visually, um, uh, McFarlane kind of hits me, you know, big. But story wise and and vibe, Ditko for sure. Okay, yeah, those yeah. guys are such the opposite sides of how to do Spider Man too. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, those are definitely my my thing. Yeah, yeah, I like what a weirdo Ditko is. I feel like I always think about if he went to Marvel or DC now, they wouldn't even look at his work. But he's like one of the form, you know, formative guys. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like you get that with a lot of, you know, like if Bob Dylan went into you know to Universal now as a new artist, like nobody would, you know, the the, the conditions kind of change. But sure. yeah, Disco is sort of um, just the vibe. Maybe not necessarily the art, but the I don't know. There's just a maybe the texture. Not the art is fairly kind of creepy that I that I, that I always enjoy. Too. Yeah, totally. And I like his like his weird kind of Ayn Randiest. Uh, philosophy when he does his own work and how like at odds that feels like with Stan Lee's kind of like you know 60s lava lamp personality <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right cool. hell yeah cool all right I'll take a question now and I'll pose it to Brandon um you've worked on a lot of different books and I've you know come in and out of your work many times I I didn't mean for that to Sounds yeah, like thank, sexual. I it. <laughs> Make it sexy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the I'm, I'm, uh, sorry. Read read so much of your work. Now, <clears throat> one thing that's amazing is profit that you've worked on, and I know that's kind of like a property uh, that you were brought into. Um, sure. Can you tell us about that? Can you tell us anything about uh, working with Liefeld? He's been um, a big topic of conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's I, that's a long it's a long topic, but yeah, <laughs> the '90s were always kind of a contentious point in comics for me because because I didn't I didn't like a lot of what was going on in superhero comics as much uh, as other people did at that point. Mm -hmm. So I was really like not a McFarlane or or Liefeld guy like that era of stuff. So I almost felt like when I got the offer to do Profit, it turned into this me kind of like. Um, like coming to Jesus with their work and kind of really digging into the early image guys and seeing the value of what they did. Yeah. Um, something I always forget that I, I want to bring up is is James Stoko. I think they originally approached to do a profit relaunch. Oh wow. Oh, and I think wow. I made fun of him about it, but <laughs> <laughs> but now he, he did some in my run too. But um, I would I wonder what he would have come up with just totally on his own if he'd done it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was uh, the work is insane. I had a I had a meeting at a comic convention with so Stevenson pitched me the idea and then I kind of wandered around the convention thinking about it and I, I had a meeting with with Eric Larson about it and and Larson was like you got to do it like Commandy and and I just kind of like nodded and I was like yeah just like Commandy and I had never read it at the time <laughs> so I went back and I, I dug up a bunch of Commandy issues and read it and was like this is so you know it's like Kirby doing Planet of the Apes and I was like I can't I'm not going to out Kirby Kirby so I kind of just, I was really into Conan comics at the time. Um, yeah, and so I, I kind of did it. I, I tried to take the core of what Profit was about and and make it like a far future science fiction. Right. And it was really fun to work on. Uh, I'm obviously like Simon Roy and Farrell Dalrymple and, and Yanni Melianis were a huge part of kind of laying the groundwork. And it's interesting because now I'm doing, I'm working on a thing right now, which is very much like a, like a um, continuation of a lot of profit ideas for me, mm -hmm. but I'm doing it with, um, it's, Farrell was on it initially, but right now the pages I'm doing with, 
it's me and um, and my friend, uh, uh, young, or sorry, my friend Shersho Penalta. Yes. It's a Spanish artist. Love him. Love draws him. these kind of Jeff Darrow details. And I'm starting to realize that with profit, like I had so many people involved, it was like this brain trust. And now I'm like, kind of like alone in the woods here. Like, oh, I got to come up with all the weird stuff on my own. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different, different approach. <laughs> you were left pretty much to your own, like kind of devices there, it seems like. Because I feel like when I read profit, in the 90s, I, I didn't like understand. I, I wasn't able to be like, oh, this is about this, you know? But like, I feel like when, when I read yours and, you know, you wrote some and drew and wrote some and just wrote some, but you were pretty much wide open there, huh? Yeah, they left me alone kind of more than I wanted sometimes. <laughs> like I would remember <laughs> email Liefeld and be like, what other superheroes could I have in here that, um, that that are in your thing and he'd be like i oh, just do whatever you want you know and so i was like give like, me some direction here but but yeah that part was really good um they never said no on anything um you know like we killed supreme in there and uh we brought in some other like eventually we did these things called profit strike files which are just kind of like like universe expanding kind of who's who things and reached out to guys like um and garrick larson and put super patriot in there and a bunch of a bunch of kind of profit adjacent characters so yeah it was such a it was such a fun project and it was one of those things that's like it, it probably ruined me working on licensed stuff because I had so much freedom oh yeah you know and like um and just the way that that characters are brought in like uh like it was really like I really enjoyed the diehard character he's kind of you know the cyborg iron man guy from from Youngblood and yeah. and bringing him in and, and trying to, uh, I got one note for him, uh, Eric Stevenson told me that at one point he, it was, so Eric Stevenson and, and I believe Eric Kennedy did a Die Hard series that never was published. And um, which I only saw a couple of pages from, but it looked amazing. And in that Die Hard became a full cyborg. And so one of the, the only edict I got from Stevenson was make sure he was a full cyborg at some point. So if we publish this, <laughs> that so the diehard character became like a full cyborg that was slowly trying to return to being a human <laughs> have you ever been approached about doing any other uh license work and if no is there something you would want to do yeah no i've done uh i there was a the whole profit team at one point was working on a power lords comic briefly which is a action figure line in the 80s Whoa. <laughs> wayne douglas barlow designed it's this really weird toys where you're like the characters kind of flip and they have like a super monster version of themselves behind it. Mm. Oh, wow. um, but that, that kind of fell through um, pretty quickly. And let's see, I, I worked on Adventure Time. That was kind of similar. Oh. I just did one episode, but that was much more like in the lane of like, here's the plot points hit. And uh, trying to think, oh, at one point, me and Andy Bellinger tried really hard to do a pit relaunch. Oh, and wow. Um, and that would have been that would have been really fun. Um, uh, unfortunately, Image Image thought they had the rights to it, I think, or, or thought that that Keown was more open to it. And then I think he wanted to do something else with his own on it. But the the premise of that would have been uh, Pitt's younger brother Bracken at the end of the series becomes like uh, kind of mixed up with this this kind of superhero alien presence, and and basically he would be an adult in it, and he'd be an assassin. And somebody comes to him. Oh, and I should mention in the Pitt series, it's it's kind of predestined that he's going to kill Pitt's son. I think was the thing. So Pitt was going to have to kill his own brother. But the whole premise of it is somebody uh, they they track him down, you know, in kind of a commando thing. Like we need you back. Pitt's gone missing, and there's a giant pit in the middle of the ocean, which is turned into like a a city that is has a, a wormhole into an alien world at the bottom of it. Wow. And so there's, and there's this stuff called, um, oh, it's like a hole, and they call it whole milk that they drink from it. And, that <laughs> the and there's a there's a woman who's basically going to be like a, a prostitute who sleeps with monster people. This is her whole thing? Is she could like handle sleeping with weird monster guys? It was it was really like we were trying to do this like really crazy heavy metal thing, and make it as like as like weird as we could possibly get away with. But uh, wow. I, I, we only we only did a couple pages. Damn, that would have been awesome. I would have loved to read that. <laughs> Jeez, ah, sweet. Did you ever do any official Mobius work? Or when uh, I think I remember seeing some sketches 
or, or so you did some like maybe tributes when he passed or something i did a lot of tribute i had a funny relationship with mobius because he was such a big deal in my life that i almost avoided interacting like there's a couple of people like um i don't know like milo minara and paul pope and mobius were like these like these like shining lights to me when i was um doing comics and so i've tried really hard to meet them in the correct ways and and with mobius i didn't want to just like fly to a convention and wait in line but i, I probably should have because i missed my chance oh, shit. damn do you meet the other two ever oh yeah no me and pope are really friendly these days i bug them all the time right. and um and uh, i got to go to it's a, it's a longer story but i got to go to italy and hang out with minara for a week once which was really cool and uh, i drew next to him at a convention and it was like the best con drawings i've done in my life because i was looking over at this like master <laughs> doing these amazing you know, these, tips and stuff yeah these ridiculously beautiful drawings and, the, and then i'd be like let me turn to my you know mayor mccheese drawing work on over here <laughs> yeah that was really cool um yeah the funny thing about that story is i remember at the time i was like i'm like a person that shouldn't be on the internet that much so uh at the time it was when the before watchman was going stuff was going on and, and, and it really like got my hackles up which is you know all in the past now but the translator between me and minara her husband had drawn one of the before watchman books and so she wanted to kind of talk to me about the logistics and the morality of that and i remember just being like minara's here i don't care about anything before watchman i care <laughs> about nothing you know <laughs> awesome man all right, let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the panel here. Um, let's see, we got Dr. B, we got Adam, we got Ryan, and we got Beverly. If any of you guys have questions, we can uh, you can raise your hand, or we'll uh, cycle back through the uh, through the crew. Um, got a question, Ryan? Oh, you got a question, Maddie? Maddie? Yeah, I was wondering for for Ben when you do licensed material, do you feel that you have a certain ownership the more you do it maybe not ownership but do you feel like those characters become yours and you get invested in them and everything as, as you keep going yeah almost to the point where i think it's a problem you know <laughs> like like profit like like i've got a profit tattoo on my arm here you know? <laughs> oh nice uh we me and all the dudes that worked on profit all got matching tattoos at a certain point i think yanni was the only one that got got away from it but like it was like such a big deal to me that like like when Liefeld does new profit stuff, I have to remind myself like he doesn't have to call you up, like let him do his thing. Right. He owns it. Right. You know, I, I think that's gotta be a difficult, like especially if you do a really formative run of something, like you did a Spider-Man run and then they change your stuff afterwards. It must feel weird, yeah. 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 I don't know if I'm necessarily built for it, but I'm I'm trying to get more zen about everything and just be like, you know. Do you so you, you would prefer, I think, a creator own work or like I, don't know. I mean, there's something really cool about working on something, especially like when it is bigger than you, you know? Right, right. Interesting. Oh, thanks. Cool. And yeah, um, guests, Madi and um, Brandon, feel free whenever just to, to get in there and ask cues and stuff. Because we're all part of the panel. We're all the panel. Man. We're all this, the panels of life. Gosh. All right, so we're going to go over to Ryan here. He's got a question. What's up, Ryan? Uh, so, um, Brandon, what is what do you think is like the definitive Brandon Graham comic? Is it Multiple Warheads? Is it King City? Profit? Like, what do you think? Uh, I always tell people to read King City first because I feel like it's the most, it was the thing I was kind of putting the most in at the time. But I feel like Multiple Warheads, it might not be for everyone, but it's the thing that feels the most like personal to me because it it doesn't like a lot of it was me trying to figure out what the hell I was doing because because King City I have a really clear like like there's a bunch of tropes I'm working on for multiple warheads I kind of fall into some tropes sometimes but I'm I was trying harder to make something that didn't exist before and it just it came out weirder I think so so probably multiple warheads. Any plans to return to King City? Uh, yeah i'm actually i'm working on so i'm working on three books right now like a crazy person but i'm doing this one of the books is called the bastard the bastard machine and it's it's set in the same king city world nice excuse me are but, you gonna do uh, magazine you, you're gonna just keep the magazine format size or you're gonna probably comic standard stars? comics i had this idea um i had this idea with the bastard machine to do do you remember the old warren ellis fell comics that were like 18 pages self-contained issues <laughs> 
one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my idea was to do kind of that format to like to make them like super dense little monthly comics that came out. Uh, so, I, so I might go with that with that one just to make them as as cheap and easy to put out as as possible. But um, yeah, it's like I'm only about fifty pages in, so anything could change, you know. Word. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, King City is bomb. For sure. <laughs> so fun. Appreciate uh, it. I wish my cat would do all that stuff. All right. So again, if anybody's got any questions, welcome Matt to the show. I finally found a spot on the shelf for your book, the giant tome that is <laughs> Tales to Enlighten. All right. Let's go back to Rick. What up, Rick? Or Dr. B, raise your hand if you want to get one in. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, what's right. up brandon i'll get you thank next. you again for coming on dude i appreciate yeah. it so much man um that was i all right let me run through my thing oh i know i know the one i know the one okay because <laughs> we we're talking about your influences and everything you know i knew mobius was a big one um the paul pope and mila Manera wasn't as aware of but you know with especially with mobius in particular you know what was that what what was the um how did you find mobius because it's never like in you know it's never in some standard way it's always like maybe some older relative or some yard sale or something like like what was that like you know because obviously that changed the game you know yeah that was exactly that my my older brother is a He's more of a fine artist these days, but all the comics that I've kind of obsessed with these days, he bought when he was a teenager and then got bored of. So there were just Mobius books around a lot. Um, and I remember it was it was right around when uh, Marvel's Epic was was translating a bunch of his stuff. So it was much easier to find back then. It's probably like 86 or something. So it's probably 10 years old. And uh, and I remember the, the Edena books coming out. Um, and years later, I talked to, there's this great artist, Michael Kaluta, that I got to talk to about Mobius. And he would always talk about how, how uh, Mobius work, like he makes drawing look easier when you look at it. And I think that was a big attachment for me early on is just seeing this stuff that looked so beautiful. And when you tried to copy it, it came out, like if you can copy a Mobius line, it, it looks so pretty, you know? So I really latched onto that. No, totally. I, I, I definitely, and that's the thing too, it, I understand that you're influenced by Mobius, but like I don't see you as like this Mobius clone either. There's this simplicity with your line work where it's like, uh, it's I don't know. It's this thing that I'm having struggles with myself where it's like you're able to leave it bare, but yet it looks so complete. Like you don't have to add like some noodling, like or anything like that. You know, you don't you like add the contours like just to do it. You know, it, and but yet it always looks complete to me. Yeah, there's a thing I was thinking about where th there's a big difference between like you want to take influences and kind of ingest them and right. and have it become part of you and not just like wear it like a coat. And I think that there's a there's a way of almost like reacting to work being like, how do I feel about this more than just like, let me copy this person's line exactly as much as I was saying copying Mobius line, because that's kind of the way you get it down, right? No, um, totally. Yeah, I always, I mean, I, I end up looking, I have a really strong relationship to looking at other people's work while I'm working. Like I always have other comics on my desk. Um, so sometimes I'll just like, almost try to be like, I'm gonna try to do a Von Baudet this page and try to channel something a little bit more. And then I'll look at his stuff and I'll be like, oh, he leaves the lines alone. I'm gonna try that this time. Um, right. And I work mostly in color, that, that kind of saves me a little bit. Yeah, there was this one page that I had, uh, it was one of the ones that I'd shared on Instagram, you know? But it's, it's, um, it was just so, I loved, it was so simple, but it's like, you see, you see the character in the middle and he's looking up, you see the light coming down of the windows on him. And then, I don't know, just the way you did it, it was just like, just one little figure, but it was just so perfect. I'm like, I would want to just like put like little, like something on the ground, like make it feel like it's not so bare. And it, I don't know. I love how you do that, man. It's hard to least of all. And sometimes those three little dots make a picture so much better. So it's almost like. Right. A, making art has so much blind faith. I think the page was from from Rainly Cameras. Yeah, that's that's what I think I figured because yeah, Mobius is that's one like 
man, because when you when you come across, well, like when you first came, when I first came across him, it was just so insane. And it's like, how do you not hear about him more? You know, but like you get into like the you get in a little bit deeper with with people and stuff and that sort of circles, then you start hearing about him more. But it's like, I don't know him and um, Drew Lay. I, I I always feel like there's like a yin and a yang to them, and those definitely I'd gotten um like the all the 70s issues of heavy metal and like that kind of like cha- like really changed everything just to see how like just to see how that looked you know it's crazy yeah they're such artist artists like i didn't realize until much later that like my impression was mobius's weird mobius stuff is even much less popular in france than his cowboy comics and so it was almost like like even in the country where you think of as like embracing mobius it's just like they still it's not entirely as popular as, as i was led to believe initially so it makes that, sense it's not everywhere over here and it's artists that always latch onto it right that doesn't make sense oh, but I'll, I'll let somebody shoot i'll let somebody get another one because I, I do still have a few but thank you again brandon appreciate you dude yeah. yes it doesn't make sense that mobius isn't like as lauded as kirby though i feel like i don't know maybe i've just put myself into this area where he's the king or whatever the other yeah, king. Mobius is, is i would argue that he might be the most influential artist of the last hundred years but um but yeah i mean that we could have a long boring conversation about the license and why it's not over here and everything and i think a lot of it is like the mobius estate is like it's mobius give us all the money and you know like dark horse comics is like we're can't sell it that crazy over here <laughs> well if you go to mobius.fr they do have that website and they have some great shirts and comics and you know, Arzac is languageless, so they have a nice collection over there. Some of it's in French, actually, but there's later stuff. But um, you can get some amazing stuff from the uh, Arzac or from the Mobius.fr website. And just a tip, the larges are mediums and the mediums and the larges. So get an extra large or uh, depending on French large. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> depending on how much weight you plan to gain. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue to our... Um, uh, we got two hands up. Let's go to those, and then we'll go to you, Manny. Is that cool? Yeah, that's fine. All right, so let's go to Dr. Ben here. I'm going to ask to unmute. Here we go. Uh, Brandon. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, well, for one, you know, like I always love uh, like your diary comics that you do, obviously. I think we've, we've discussed that before. And just like how open you are with uh, – you know, just different, different, uh, speed bumps and say that, like, I know, like, I think you had talked about, like, you had had, you survived cancer, you beat cancer, like, years ago, and then, uh, I guess that was one of the things I appreciated, like, in, in Rain Like Hammers at the end, uh, you know, your, your, your diary, diary part at the end of that, where you're talking about being in this depression, frunk and stuff, and, and so really, it's more, it's, it's, it's just a completely self-serving question of what sort of tips you would have. <laughs> like, uh, cause I'm definitely like in a funk, like from, from actual like medical stuff too, but uh, any, any sort of tips you have for breaking out of funks and getting out of those, like, uh, you know, like artistic, just, uh, you know, you're just like, what, what, what am I doing? I'm just scribbling here. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. that's that's a big question <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry dealing with medical stuff um yeah yeah it's you know i'm still breathing <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, I think that's that's a big part of it for me is that i'm still breathing aspect um <laughs> i i find it's difficult with my diary stuff <coughs> i find that it really helps my mood just to talk everything out and find a way to kind of express it in comics it's almost like if you do like a diary of like I feel shitty and worthless. Here is why, and this is it in pictures. By the time you get to the last, to the bottom of the page, it's like I feel a little bit better because it's, it's at least it's out there. And and I've noticed that a lot of mine kind of almost end on this more positive note because, you know, once I've spent twenty minutes drawing it, I'm just like I feel a little less shitty right now. But um, yeah, it's it's really difficult because like yeah, there's no there's no easy way to deal with depression because so much of it I think is like just chemical right. and you can tell yourself the actual facts of like this is how good things are and I'm overreacting everything but it's like if you feel a certain way you're going to feel a certain way right like, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, there's some catharsis in that too like I, I read a lot of Bukowski stuff and 
I get a lot out of his writing about the shittiest times in his life. And it's, it's almost, it's really helpful to be like, this guy found some joy out of the shitty stuff. There's a really good poem he wrote called the, um, I'm spacing on the name of it, but it's basically all about how like life is very shitty, but if you try really hard, you can find these bright moments in it. And I think that that is an element of that. Like, it's almost like expect shittiness, but, but if you, if you can get away with finding joy in life, then, then that's like your job just to like, just to scoot a little past the, the <laughs> nightmare part and, and make the decision to be like, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to have fun today, no matter how shitty the world is. I love that you said scoot past it. Cause <laughs> my, my buddy, my buddy and me used to work with this lady and she would always, anytime she'd be leaving, she's like, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and scoot. I'm going to scoot out of here. <laughs> like, That's the lady I'm talking about. <laughs> why not? Awesome. She's, we called her gray beard. So, you know, <laughs> is that like a Lord of the Rings reference or something? Uh, no, just cause she just had a gray beard. Yeah. We just, we just made fun of her, you know, <laughs> Word. Thanks, Dr. B. Right on. All right, let's go back over to Ryan here. Jabba. So, so I was thinking about um, Brain Like Hammers, and I was really digging the, you know, all the crazy sci-fi concepts that you put into all that stuff. Thanks. So, um, and, you know, all that, all that stuff you put into profit, too. So I was really just enjoying it, but it seems like you just abandoned it. Can you talk more about, like, what all went into that series and how you just kind of, I don't know, maybe I misread it, but then you just kind of just feel like you're like, all right, this is enough of this and I'm out. Oh, you mean as the end of the story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that one's complicated because it was that, that book is very much dealing about depression and, and feeling like, you know, I had a lot of bad public fallings out with people and, and I was trying to like articulate that in a story. And I didn't really, I had this idea when I started that was like, I'm going to figure out my life by the time I get to the end of this thing. And then I hit the end and I was kind of at this place where I was like, there's no clean answers. And, and it is just kind of shit continues and you can either decide to wallow in it or you can kind of move on. And so that was kind of, that was what I was attempting to be with the ending. Like I was literally make a list of like, let me, let me talk about everything I need to talk about in the story and in my life in this. And then I just kind of got to this end of it where like I often think about how um, like the reader needs an emotional ending, but that you don't necessarily need to wrap up everything in the story in a way that 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 solves everything. Because I feel like that's um, it, it's it's probably a little unsatisfying to read. So I apologize for that. But I, I feel like it's me trying to say like like life isn't gonna solve everything for you. So sometimes it's just like, well, this still sucks, but I gotta go do something else. Yeah. That's that's kind of what I got from it, but I was just like, you know, it's been a while since it came out, and I was just like, did I, did I remember that right? Anyway, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's weird too because there's all this stuff where I'm like, I'm trying to talk about big serious issues, but I realize that all the tools that I have are like stupid science fiction comics. So I'm like, I'm like, how do I talk about depression and and all this bullshit in my life? And then you know, it's like, it's like all I've got is Spider Man and Star Trek tools to do it with. <laughs> But what more do you need, right? Yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you gotta use kind of what speaks to you, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Was that an invitation to talk about the Picard season series finale tonight? <laughs> I watched the for you. season of Picard no. and I felt so hurt by it. I couldn't go back. I was like, oh. what are you doing? I'll <laughs> tell you, man, the season three makes up for both seasons one and season two, I'll tell you. I've returned to Red Dwarf this week, so I'm I'm, I'm now. <laughs> oh, nice! I, they they made a movie I was unaware of. Uh, for the Sci-Fi Channel, was that what they were airing on? Or was it maybe? I, I don't know what I watched it on, but it was about like they they finally interact with like the cat people that that left the Red Dwarf. Oh my god! Really fun. Sickness. All right, sweet. Uh, I got a sweet feral uh, drawing of uh, Tuvok from Voyager from one of his. Uh, Kickstarters or, or whatever it was, go not GoFundMe, but I was like, dude, I need this. Oh yeah, Farrell yeah. loves Tubac the way that people love their kids. <laughs> <laughs> Tubac is a great character now. Uh, no spoilers, but he may or may not have been in season three of Picard. 
Uh, it's yeah, so good point. Trying to drag me back in. <laughs> uh, uh, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's one of those shows where I'm like watching it and my girlfriend's like sleeping next to me. I'm like, oh, Jack. And then I have to be like, oh my God, she's <laughs> sleeping. She's like, what the fuck? All right, back to you, Manny. No more Star Trek talk. That was the, the duration of Star Trek talk. Uh, we'll kick back to you, Manny. Yeah, I wanted to, to um, talk about Star Trek. Back to- Just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> I could talk about Star Trek all night, but uh, I know another um, podcast, Manny. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, for for Madi, I mean, we talked about um, Boo like Spider Man, but um, you want to talk about like Steel Streets and where you're at, where you're with, where you're at with it now, and like you know what you want to do with it going forward because you're you're on what five issues now, six, six, yeah, six, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just I released the sixth issue, Steel Streets, just this month. Um, and it's been my, it started as kind of a, an homage to the comics of the 80s and the Ninja Turtles at the beginning. And then slowly it kind of morphed into its own, into its own thing. And uh, stylistically, definitely more of an homage to the early Mirage Studios days, where, uh, you know, I, I tried to apply duo tone, a lot of stark blacks, a lot of you know, fun action and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, but so far it's it's an ongoing series. I six um, issue six is a part one of two, and then after issue oh, six, nice. yeah, and then I think after that it's going to conclude the first season. After which I think I'm going to you know come out with a collection at some point, and then in between the first and second season, I'll probably work on some other projects I've been wanting to get to. Um, one of which is uh, something I want to do more in the style of the. A bande dessinée, like the French, oh, nice. the Belgian comics. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the comics that I grew up with. Being, I'm, I'm Algerian, and so I'm, I you know, speak French, and I grew up uh, with my uh, with my family giving me a lot of Aster- Asterix and Obelix and Lucky Luke and all these guys. So I, I grew up with that. My art is nothing like that at all. I mean, <laughs> but uh, but I, but I love it. <laughs> I'm trying. I want to kind of veer towards that really something maybe and then go back to steel streets yeah that's surprising that was such a thing I, i've got a box of all the asterisks behind me i just started reading those again they're so like they're too good it's amazing yeah and lucky luke the man faster than his own shadow it's like how can you not <laughs> i just i just read my first lucky luke last month and i loved it oh really oh cool yeah that's it was good. so good and i think there's a there's like a new i have like i have the bastion beeves chrono maltese here and i know they did a um like a lucky luke relaunch recently too so you know i think yeah i saw that i saw that as well yeah Drawn- oh, where'd Drawn- you find duotone oh no, i i it's uh it's digital digital application okay yeah yeah I, I tried, that. Weird yeah, old. <laughs> right, right right i tried finding it but it's it was impossible like i really tried i went through all the channels i was hours never didn't go as far as the dark web but <laughs> I should <laughs> the duotone dark web and sell you a child or do a tone. Yeah, exactly. I just need, I just need a, the dark tone, please. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no. That, yeah. I so until now you've uh, you've just um been self publishing, right, Madi? So it's like, um, are you considering, or would you consider like going to through a publisher, or is that something that you have a goal with, or do you want to just keep doing it yourself? I mean. I mean, I, yeah, so so Superhero Comics, I started that because I I like the idea of having my own kind of uh, publishing house. And the whole concept of that publishing house is that it had been around since the 50s. So it's it's, it's like the whole concept of the actual physical publishing house is a meta thing where they were alongside Marvel and DC putting out books. And that's why all of my books have different uh, timestamps on it where like the steel street yeah. yeah it comes and out all the and, fake ads and stuff yeah yeah 1987 you know that's when steel streets is out and i have another one black and red is 1952 and it's as if the <laughs> company had been putting out these comics but forgotten in time and because i figure in 200 years no one's going to know the difference so, so why not uh, as but working for another publisher i mean yeah i mean, i i'm new to the comics world so i i want to do everything i Whenever, you know, I would watch the cartoonist Kayfabe channel and they talk about mini comics and immediately I would go and make a mini comic because they were, because I, I was learning all these new things. Uh, I want to do the, the bon dessiné, different formats, manga. I want to try all these, uh, all these different genres and everything. And yeah, I mean, I, I haven't approached, I think at the beginning, I, I might've sent out a few emails, but 
I haven't approached any publishers um, easily working on something. Would I be? Would I like to work on? A, on yeah, is there a project you are a property you would love to work on that like that isn't yours? I mean, I don't have an an idea in particular. I mean, Spider Man, why not? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if Marvel said, I'd love to see more Spider Man for me. Yeah, we'll do we'll do bootleg Spider Man uh, as a you know after hours <laughs> you know adult <laughs> type comic. I'm like 100 percent, I'll do it. I, I have a lot of crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I would I think I would see it as a fun fun little challenge. If any publisher told me you want to do on any type of thing as a one shot or whatever, I think I'd. I'd probably say yeah and just try to make it my own and do do whatever I could with it. Yeah, it'd be really cool to see your version of Turtles. Oh, I was yeah. gonna say yeah. I would love to do that, yeah. Or Fugitoid. Or, hell, a turtle or a turtle uh, steel streets crossover, man, you know, like oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did a variant cover for like a Cerebus reprint of Turtles thing recently. It was like the oh, yeah. Cerebus Turtles crossover issue, and it had a character in it that's like this time travel woman. And and like my wheelhouse for turtles is always just mirage stuff, and then a little bit of the movies and everything. Yeah. Um, I have a turtle story I should get to actually, but uh, <laughs> but realizing how much the characters just from this little one shot have been redrawn and everything, like this this uh, magician lady, they like she was in the cartoon, she was in like several different comics, so it was really cool to like, you know, it was like a whole undiscovered history of this that I that I'd seen. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I was going to tell like a, like a side story. I worked in an animation company in the early 2000s and um, the child, the guy who was played uh, the redheaded kid in the first Ninja Turtles movie works as an animator now and he was there. <laughs> and um, he didn't tell me for like a year. I knew the guy and then like a friend of mine just brought me into a room and was like, check this out and puts on Ninja Turtles. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've seen this before. And he's like, no, no, that's the dude we work with. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, the kid yeah. that stole the money out of April's purse in the movie. Oh yeah, no, he's a he's a bum in the movie. He joins the foot clan. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Sid Vicious T-shirt. <laughs> um, I got to meet, but I got to meet Kevin Eastman through him, which was a really big deal to me. Oh, amazing! I was like, you know, I was like 25 and in New York, and we went out to a bar together drinking, and I was like, just, I'm gonna be cool. I'm gonna be cool as like a regular guy, you know. And Kevin Eastman, like this, like I knew that he'd like married a penthouse pet and like owned a tank <laughs> he lived in a bank vault and all these crazy things <laughs> oh my god i didn't know any of that true. <laughs> don't take my word for it but and i remember i got so i got like three drinks into it and i just started going off about how much i love the triceratons i couldn't hold it <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the best. Best. yeah he's the sweetest guy in the world that's amazing yeah for sure one of the biggest creators that like didn't let it affect him almost at all I've never once heard someone be like, oh, the dude's a dick. Oh, yeah. That was oh, a always a gem. And him and Peter Laird are kind of the indie indie gods. They're like the they're the mantra, you know, they're because you can they're the proof that you can do some be be nobodies, quote unquote, you know, and just do something purely that you enjoy for yourself and everyone might like it. You know, it's it's a beautiful thing to think about. I mean, that's what inspired me for sure. Just uh, anytime I think to myself, oh, I should cater to this or I should try and draw like this or, oh, people really like this. I just think about Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman. I'm like, oh, fuck it. No. Yeah, totally. I'm going to draw what I want and see what happens. It's crazy because they essentially did like a parody of Daredevil that's bigger than Daredevil now. Yeah. Right. That's what I was going to say too. Like, don't feel bad if you're like, your original creation is like a riff off these things you love because it's like, everything is a riff off something Absolutely. that that person loved you know i mean in steel streets i i went so far as to homage the homage of the homage because i wanted to carry the torch where it, in my comic it's not the foot or the hand it's the head clan so oh, it's <laughs> not master stick or splinter it's master plank you know what i mean so it's just like you know that's I, what I, i'm I, saying though it, it could almost all be in the same world like we could just be like you know like what if there's all these ninja organizations there's a hand there's a head there's a foot you know like well and they come together and they become you know the full body yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you yeah, gotta have the amazing. turtles and steel treats and daredevil there's your crossover man you know the like you're gonna have a field day with that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> nice. or it's a hell of a bootleg comic you know like yeah 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 that would be cool. I had a friend that would always sell me the idea that Daredevil made a better villain than he would be a hero because he's like, he's like a blind. You just imagine a bunch of ninjas that are just like trying to hang out in Hell's Kitchen, 
and there's like a blind demon lawyer there. That's, it just sounds terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. I can hear when you're lying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The vigilantes in the courtroom and out, you know? So yeah. he, he doesn't tie you up and leave you hanging like Batman does. He just brings you right into the courtroom. And yeah, that's so much scarier. <laughs> Yeah, it brings you in, and then he goes into you as a lawyer. It's like, he sues you for damages, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, that's good. All right, um, Rick, you want to, let's take it back to you. Oh, also, I put in the deleter-usa website because they do have some screen tones available. They're not like the exact ones we might look for, like the dot patterns or like gradient patterns. But they do have some like interesting kind of fun things that might be worth, you know, if you're just trying to, to, to try it out. And anytime I've ordered something from them, they come with a um, little promo package of like little squares like this. And uh, so I got a lot of miles out of those too. So it might be worth it. It's in the chat. Oh, Eli, I just noticed you're wearing a Bombay shirt. Oh, yeah. It's from the, uh, well, they're, they're, work, they're working on a movie and uh, there was a Kickstarter for it. Oh, awesome. The movie is confusingly called The Book of Vaughn. But should be good. <laughs> yeah, as long as they're making more of this stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm down for it. All right, Rick, back to you, buddy. Um the, I'm going to I'm going to ask Madi, but it's really for both of you. Um cuz I usually if you've if you've watched this enough times for anyone on here, I usually ask people like, how do they manage their like time management? Basically, that's a big one I want to know about. And then also with that, uh, how do you juggle social media? You know, like I'll start with Madi, but I would love to hear what you have to say about that too, Brandon. Um, so as an indie guy, just kind of at the more uh, beginning part of his career, I I definitely had a full time job as I was getting all my books done, and. Mm -hmm. uh, just like working as a barista, in, you know, in downtown. So it was a good job. You know, I had, I had my, my mind was free to think of stories. My body was in use, but I had a lot of time in between shifts to, to work. And I remember watching a Todd McFarlane uh, interview where he said, you got to do a page a day. And I was like, all right, well, you said it, so let's do it. And so I, I made it my goal to still try to manage to do a page a day, even, you know, while, while working and stuff. And so that, mean, that meant on my lunch break, I used to bring some, I had a little iPad, I used to bring the iPad uh, set it on top of the espresso machine and draw in between drinks, you know, when my, when my boss wasn't there. <laughs> that was right. um, and then slowly, as I kind of managed to get a little more uh, successful when it comes to, you know, sales of books and stuff like that, I, I'm going down in days at the cafe. And so I have more time to dedicate to just pure uh, comic book making. Um, and vis-a-vis -vis social media, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't particularly like it, but I but I do it every day just because I think it's a it's a nice kind of mood board. But I I don't try to cater to I don't know uh, the algorithm or trends and, and stuff like that. I'll 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 try and post as as often as I can, uh, just to share things with people who want to see my art. But if I start to get to thinking about if I start creating for social media, then it makes me sad personally. And so I, I try to just kind of remember that the reason I'm doing all this is because I love it. And it's it's ultimately for me, it's my expression, it's enjoying myself and whatever. And so I shouldn't ever cater to what I think people want to see. I should just do and then show, you know, and see, see what happens, but, and not equate, you know, likes to, to value or to or to self you know it's the moment and then totally that's, that's, that's for me oh that's great yeah that sounds like a remarkably sane approach um i can feel like i can yeah. always tell when i'm not doing well because i'm looking at social media a lot like i do like 20 posts about something i'd be like i gotta go for a walk something's not <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, there's a, I always think of the phrase, like, first you get, I think it was a Dave Sim thing, where he said, first you get good, then you get fast. And mm -hmm. I used to take, I was much slower when I did, like, King City stuff. I would take, um, you know, like, I was doing, like, three pages a week, I think. And and they're pretty detailed pages, so it makes sense. But right right now, I'm working for, I'm working with a video game company on this this comic called Moonray. And, and every week on Monday, I have to uh, show them what I've done in the week. 
and uh, and so I set myself like <clears throat> like four page minimum, uh, and 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 that's just like bare baseline. So I like I end up just kind of like kind of taking Monday and Tuesday off, and then just giving myself a chunk of hours that I need to be like at my desk working. Um, I almost it's funny I almost miss when I had a day job more because it made the drawing life so much more exciting it's like the worst thing it can do is become like this obligation of like oh no I have to go do my favorite thing right now you know <laughs> and I feel like I do so many things to trick myself into enjoying drawing like I'll literally sit down and be like all right I'm using an audiobook that'll keep me at the desk and I just have to pencil out this page and then ideally by the time I've got the page penciled I'm like oh I like doing this why why was it even a fight to to get there no that's I really I, that's that's great man because I, I have such a hard time with that shit and not, like like Madi I I'm a server on on like uh on the weekends like in the mornings you know so it's a little it's a little it's a little similar but I just same exactly. thing where it's like once I'm out yeah I try to just immediately do that try to stay up as late as I can get up early and do the same shit all over again you know i mean as as far as i'm concerned it's the whole why like why am i trying to be a like a comic a comic book artist and get known by people and everything? It, the whole point is just to do it so if i'm doing it then i'm i'm living like i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing you know what i mean right kind of like finding that that balance and accepting that when you're just tired i mean working in service you know working class it's like you get tired it's on your feet yeah. your knees. Oh, yeah. like, i mean, my 30s now like my left knee is just whack it doesn't know it doesn't know what it's doing anymore so you just <laughs> kind of like all right and then sometimes you need a nap sometimes thing and i think creative people sometimes when you're not actually doing something you know you're still ruminating you're kind of you're processing your inspirations i think and then it can it can flow more freely i don't know I, I always find it funny to talk like this when I just go back and I draw like just ninjas cutting heads off and stuff like that. Just, <laughs> through you, just splatter, splatter. <laughs> hey, how are you finding the Mirage stuff? Because I feel like it probably came out like when you were too young for it. Yeah, I I, I found it retroactively for sure. I was uh, I didn't even know there was a comic of Ninja Turtles until uh, honestly a couple years ago. So I, I really dove deep because I, I grew up with the with the cartoon and you know the movies and stuff like that, the toys. But uh but yeah, the comics came into my life, you know, like now. Like I got all the volumes and I'm just I just read them all. It's fantastic. Nice. Yeah. And the whole vibe of Mirage, I think the Ninja Turtles is one thing, but I just like the artistic, just the community that Mirage Studio was of bringing people in and then testing the limits and seeing what you can do and it wasn't, it was purely about the art, you know, the expression, the story, whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. You ever read Gizmo? That was one, I think that's my favorite Mirage Studio book. Gizmo? I don't, I don't think I have. No. It's like... That I, Michael Dooney it. shit. Yeah, Michael Dooney. Dooney. He, uh, it's about like a, a robot and a baseball cap and this big fuzzy dog guy. Mm. Um, it's hard to, it, I don't run into that much these days, but it's really, it's really fun and weird. That's all. Awesome. And there's a Gizmo Fugitoid two shot, I think, too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Fugitoid's pretty great too. Yeah, the Mirage, the, the the whole Eastman and Laird and Mirage thing, again, this is another thing I could talk about endlessly, but like it's it's fully the comic book dream because it's got like everything from like these dudes. I I I they had to be like getting stoned and like making each, each other laugh from from that to like our shit is on every pair of sweatpants at Target, backpacks. It's like the full gamut. Plus, in the like 80s and 90s, Mirage was like this freewheeling, like amazing warehouse full of, you know, uh, cubicles where they're drawing and shooting each other with pellet guns and blasting music and going drinking and playing pool and doing all the stuff. It's like, it's the most epic comic book story i think of all time it's what you imagine like the marvel bullpen should have been like if it but it was probably you know? never like, like that it was probably exactly never. yeah like it's 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 our dream of that you know where it's like a bunch of guys creating comics and shooting the shit and yeah like and when like, you see you know, Bart like, like, go to mad and it's like all that shit that's like really weird. yeah dude what a great example perfect yeah i forgot about that but yeah when he opens the door at mad magazine oh yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I used to go pitch stuff at DC Comics in the early 2000s and uh, Mad Magazine was in the same building in, in Manhattan. And I remember at that time they had a big Alfred E. Newman What Me Worry statue. And there was this one moment where they had to lay off a ton of people at Mad Magazine. And I remember thinking about the horrible thing of having you getting a, your your pink slip and having to leave the job and walking by a, <laughs> walking by with your box of shit like with, with yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, I bet you some uh, dirty ass photos were taken with that robot at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go over to Adam Lemna, who's got a question. Uh, I'll ask to unmute you. What's up, Adam? Hey, guys. Um, so a question I have, um, we always talk about, like, how do you get to a point where you can become successful in comics? What do you do when you're successful? In comics, my question is more like, what do you do? What What is your approach to the leaner times? When, you know, like when you finish a book before you've lined up the next thing, or if you find something has like fallen apart or like, you know, how do you guys get through the lean times? What's your, do you have a network? Do you, you know, are, are you willing to take more like job type things? Like, because I think this is something we need to talk about as well, because it's not always going to be like abundance and plenty, you know? So it's good to know how other people approach that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can jump on this. Uh, I mean, for the the nice thing is, I am I feel like I have enough of a readership at this point where I can do commissions and that really saves my ass sometimes. But um, like... Uh, I, I guess it's almost like a two, a two part thing. Like, do you mean like on a financial level or on an emotional level? You know, I, I think both really. I mean, like, obviously because like emotionally you can become, you know, bereft after a certain amount of time too and drained and yeah. unable to deal with like other people, but also financially, I mean, like, because that's always a struggle, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, the financial one's harder too, because I, I feel like it's, it's nice to know, it's nice to know that you can go back to shitty work if you have to, that isn't comics, you know? Yeah, but you don't want to do that, of course. No, I mean, it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> um, I, like, I don't know, it's difficult. I have this really snob idea that there's nothing, and I say this because I do it too much, that my least favorite thing is to, is to do an art job that I hate. Like if I have to work on like a, you know, like a, you know, I've worked on some like, movie work that I'm not super excited about and things like that sure, where it's like, sure. it pays good but it's a little draining compared to what you really want to be doing um yeah it's it's really difficult because it does not I don't think there's really like an easy answer because it is always like you're like what to do when stuff sucks <laughs> right yeah yeah there's no books out there like that you know like what do you do when you uh, you are like even when you're like starting to become more successful and you just you know you still have those times in between work yeah because there's you know? you get a cash of of fun ideas and you're like i want to do this comic and this comic and then you finish them and you're like yeah i don't have anything else to pull from what do i do now and you're also like you know creatively drained because you've yeah. been doing something for a certain amount of time and that takes that takes it out of you you know yeah, I think breaks are really important sometimes, and it, it can be like a really minor, like, like I don't like to compartmentalize stuff, be like, I have a deadline on Monday, but for right now, I'm just going to like sit on a beanbag chair and not worry about anything and almost like lie to myself about like, what would I want to draw right now? And I almost like loop it back into tricking myself to draw. Like, like I, I'm burnt out on drawing and I have no ideas. If I went to the comic store right now and just like imagine walking in the door there, like what, what what would I actually go into and yeah. find myself that would be exciting to me? And then it's almost like you're fan fictioning your own future, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's hard too, because then you having to actually actualize that, because you can be like, you know, I want a you know, sexy barbarian lady comic. And then you're like, how do I not make that suck? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, that's a great approach to it. And uh, you know, it's it's just a hustle all the time to like keep coming up with new ideas i think it's so weird because like it's it, nobody even has a chance to even take a step back you know because on social media you want to constantly be putting out content 
Yeah, it's draining. Something that I do a lot these days, I feel like I barely post my own work and I mostly am just like, here's a stupid cartoon that I'm reading about on Wikipedia. And that kind of helps yeah. me feel like I'm still feeding the monster while also um, like, like it's almost like, yeah, because there is something really horrible about being like, I have to finish this page so I can show it to people on social media. Because that should be a positive thing, but it so quickly can turn into a negative thing. Totally. Like yeah. Process reels. Oh, imagine every time you have to do a, a piece of art, you set up a camera to film it. It's like it's you know. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's a strange feeling. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You know, and it's great to have you on. Yeah, good talking. I, I don't know if that helped, but <laughs> no, like no, it it really does. Just to hear, you know, a that these things do happen. You know, and that it's not always just like a, you know, cavalcade of successes, but like, you know, how to survive the lean times. You know, I was just reading the uh, the article uh, on the comic journal um, with Steve Bissett, you know, where he's yeah. talking about, you know, going to work uh, in academia. Sure. You know, when he got when he got fed up with comics. You know, and so it's a, it kind of put into my mind sort of like, well, yeah, what, what does happen when things sort of fall apart, but you still have that skill and it's still marketable, but like, how do you pivot to other things? Do you pivot to other things? You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a scary thing too, because I think a lot of people, comic books becomes their identity and the idea I, of you can work in something else, but then you're giving up your identity becomes really scary. Yeah. I think people are infinitely yeah, more complicated than that where... I think, you know, if you're an artist, but you're also a, a bartender or a carpenter or anything, it's still, you're still successful in what you're doing. You're just doing many things. I mean, I don't think anyone is just one thing. So if and I- You can if find I were, art in those things too. Like you can find art in making the best drink or making the best espresso or- Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. I never believe that an artist is just in the arts. You know, if you see anyone doing their thing in their flow, it's artistic you know you see a plumber doing his thing it's like it's it's fantastic you know but it's real and uh and so i don't know if i were to keep doing my indie book and have to work in service you know my whole my whole life would i consider myself not successful i don't think so i no. think exactly so it's just kind of like maybe it's a, a perspective and uh an idea but also yeah you do need cash you know right. that's true that does sound like a remarkably sane <laughs> yeah. way to, to approach it if something that's weird to me too is the weird feeling of feeling like i suddenly made it at a certain point and then suddenly feel like people are talking about you as much and having that not affect your ego is a weird yeah. thing i have a lot of conversations with myself where i'm just like stop being an asshole chill out you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah agreed like it's got to suck to be steve Bissett and have people not realize that you're so good you know <laughs> Right. And that he's still been, I mean, like it was remarkable too in the article because, you know, he lists off a bunch of things that he has done work for, you know, but it's all zines that his students have done and things like that. But I feel like that could be maybe even more interesting than if he was drawing like DC or Marvel, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it, he, and he mentioned in there, one thing that he mentioned was that um, that there hasn't been a collection of that stuff. And so I'd, I'd really love to see something like that, too. You know, just to see, like, what else is there? Yeah, and I feel like something that isn't talked about enough is almost like what happens to artists over their whole lives, you know? Like, exactly. Like what happens when you get old? Are you still... Because there's such a focus on the new, and it's like, oh, this new artist came out, they're amazing, and they're going to... Um, what's their run on X-Men going to be like? You know, and then and then yeah. forget about them for the next person. Well, it's sort of like, you know, it's like the approach to, you know, Kirby or something like that. In his time, he was super popular, but then 10 years later, like, his style is completely gone. And he has to fight to get jobs, even though he's, like, the most dynamic artist in comics, you know? Yeah, Kirby's always a really good example because he was so disrespected in his lifetime to the point where people are like, he was inventing characters and they were like, let me send this to have the face fixed, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah like, we're not going to use your Superman face. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like, you're never going to be, no one's ever going to be treated as shitty as Jack Kirby was. <laughs> no, and yet be so talented. That's the thing, you know? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, great artists are never appreciated whilst they are alive, it seems. That's why you got to fake your own death, enjoy the spoils <laughs> for a bit, and then come back later and be like, yo! <laughs> like Jim Morrison's going to do in five more years. Oh, that'd be great. He's going to come back. Oh, going to Tupac. <laughs> or Andy Kaufman. Uh-huh. All right, cool. Any other questions from guests? We got a few new people popping in or anything or not. I've got a, a process question I'm interested in, um, especially for, I mean, for both guests as well. I mean, Brandon, your colors are so on point. They're so like, you've basically got like, I would consider you have like this palette of your own that you use. Uh, how do you go about, how did you go about cultivating that? And then What's your process for coloring? I'm sure it's digital, but uh, how do you go about that? And then I'll 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 ask the same to you, Maddie, because you also have a super on point. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it is me just trying to imitate. Yeah. Initially, it was me trying to imitate um, both like Mobius's the coloring on Mobius books, and also a lot of the kind of '80s Japanese Shonen Jump stuff I was looking at, like the way that like the Kira Toriyama looks, or like. Um, uh, like Herge, the the Tintin guy, like like his his style is really fascinating to study because he he got really into Japanese woodblock printing, and you go back and look at the the Japanese stuff he was looking at, it looks like French comics, like color wise. Nice. And a lot of it is like me trying to get that aesthetic, but I always in my head I always think about how things print slightly darker. So I'm always um, I always think of the JFK assassination thing where they talk about back and to the left, his head. I always go up and to the left when I'm on the color palette. Like I'm be like, I want to do red, but I want to do it grayer, like a little lighter and grayer. Mm -hmm. And then you mix like really popping colors with that sometimes. And I think it, it makes things jump out a lot too. I figured it was the Mobius influence a little bit, but then he used so many like uh, gradients and I feel like your colors are always just like, bam, here, bam, here. I'm much more into the flat stuff, but I think a lot of it was like, that was a reaction to against 90s uh, coloring because 90s stuff was all gradients and I just wanted it, the simple Tintin flats. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's interesting. Something that, that really helped my brain a lot in coloring in recent years is I started to think more about tone and less about specific colors. So I'd almost be coloring something and be like, he's got a red sword. I don't want to have like a red cape next to it. And I realized I could do just slightly change the tone of the reds and you can put them right next to each other and and they almost mm. operate as different colors. Mm. That's interesting. About that, did you find? Did you like? You do do digital coloring mostly. I mean, it kind of almost entirely to. these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do Do you find yourself using like uh, a Shonen Jump or anything to like grab colors from? Do you take photos or anything, or is it kind of just like you find it on the palette? I have a bunch of like I have Pinterest. I always look at, and then I have a bunch of. Um, just folders of different color things that I put in there. I usually only look at those when I'm doing um, covers oftentimes of, yeah, I don't know. A lot of it was just messing around in Photoshop forever. And, and I feel like my coloring is really simple. So it'll just be like, you know, something I like to do a lot is uh, we did this on profit a lot. We would, um, uh, Joseph Bergen was a colorist on that. And sometimes the deadlines would be coming really close. And so we'd start to plan like this whole scene is in red and we just put a red, over everything and then just work on shadows. And it made the stuff really pop out in nice ways. Remember we had one issue, I probably told this story a bunch of times before. Uh, Farrell Dowrymple did this incredibly detailed issue where uh, one of the prophet characters falls into this alien ship and, um, and there's like a mind thing that's making all the alien slaves there. And the colorist was like, we are not gonna hit the deadline on this one if we if we do it normally. So we came up with the idea to do it in black and white. Like he falls into the into the alien mind control thing and then, and then the color dampens immediately. And it works in the story and it just made everyone's job so much easier. So I think kind of doing things that like kind of giving yourself the option to, to work smarter and, and less hard and, and, and think about when the color benefits the story is really fun. Yeah. Another check on the column of where duress sometimes breeds the most creativity because you can't really, you can't do everything you want to do. So you got to like kind of figure it out. And yeah, that's certainly the goal always, right? Because it also can make things suck more. It just seems like. It can, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, I guess there's those like Marvel's comics that like the kayfabe channel is covered where it's like they had a week to redo this and you can tell Iron Man. <laughs> 187 or whatever it is have you guys ever heard about pond scum 
What's that? So when I when I was living in New York around like 99 to 2005, there was this dude there named Pond Scum. They called him Scummy. And basically, if your deadline, if you're on a superhero book and you weren't going to hit the deadline, they would call up Scummy and he would just show up like the enforcer and like get your pages inked in like a week. And he was just this mythological figure that everyone would use. Wow. Kind of like the wolf in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Pulp, I was about to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, Brandon. Now, Maddie, you don't do a ton of colors inside. You do a lot of tones and like, you know, it kind of gives it the feel of color. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think of it that way as well? Or do you think of it as, you know, yeah. do you think yeah, of it as a color when you do your tones? I think with tones, because I mean, I do, um, especially in the last issue, I, I did most of it practically because before, because of the day job and everything, I would I would constantly flip back and forth between practical and digital pages. Mm -hmm. um, but this time it's doing it. So it's always, it always starts in black and white. And with the tones, yeah, definitely getting the depths. And how do you, when you have a scene of like a city or whatever, and you have all these different things, how do you color it all differently? How do you color the cab versus the, the building, this thing, but all in black and white or with tones and everything? So yeah, definitely I, I try to see it as... Uh, as color or at least as gradients or as something how, how many grades can you get on a page basically you know and digitally i feel like there's a, a whole galaxy of grays you can kind of finagle and then using dots and bigger dots and smaller dots and lines and double lines and all the shit exactly exactly in nice. my other series i had done a lot of uh, color comics digitally as well or similar to, to brendan i would kind of go for the the flats mm -hmm. for sure and um really try to do things that harken back to the European comics because for some reason yeah just the flat colors just, just kind of speak to me more in terms of the storytelling I don't know it kind of doesn't distract as much I right think. And, yeah. yeah and I feel like they're just it's it's gives it a more dynamic kind of like pop yeah versus like any if it gets muddy or if it like you know I was trying to do this cover today and I was like I, I want to do this watercolor kind of thing on my um, the computer and i'm gonna do all these colors but then like i kept seeing in my head just like straight flats that's what it that's so we'll see i didn't do it yet but. Mm -hmm. all right sweet um go back to uh manny what you got bud uh, i got nothing right now actually you're not supposed to say that manny you're breaking the, <laughs> the fourth wall I'm, breaking. I'm just kidding um what about you rick you got a ton i bet um i'm not sure if you're this is for Madi, by the way. I'm not sure if you're talked about it or not yet, um, but tell me more, if you can, about that action figure you've been showing off, dude. Oh, snap. Oh, the action figure. Oh, Good question. I got it right here. Yeah, I, I love figures, man. Yeah. And I definitely want one of those if you're going to start producing them. Look at that. That's so, fucking oh, awesome, dude. Yeah, That's so cool, dude. Uh, did you make that? Like did someone no, tell someone us, please? A wonderful guy named Andre that works at Forbidden Planet, the comic shop here in New York. I was dropping off some books and uh, he came up to me and said, yeah, I was reading your indie comics. Da, da, da. I'm a toy maker. I said, well, that's obviously yeah. going to happen now because <laughs> you're in. Because um, like I was saying before, anything, mini comics, yes, I wanted uh, big comic, everything, posters, prints, t-shirts. I want it all because I want all the mythos. I just, you know, I started dabbling in animation just to get my own cartoon you know going and so yeah so then he he i commissioned him to make these uh these action figures i i designed the box and he made the figure and i was you know i was stunned because it's i think i actually do you know what base he started off with or was it like uh some sort of other figure first uh i think he 3d models it uh oh from snap. Yeah, that's sure. now, i sent him uh i sent him a character sketch he got full full range of motion. Look at that. Hold on, let me yeah, spot. Have to big screen. Oh, oh. Damn, damn, dude. That's so fucking cool. He got weapons in the holster. <sighs> it comes with two weapons. <laughs> because originally what I had done was um, I had made a... Because in the, my books, in the back of the books, there's a lot of um, just fake ads that I, that I put. So, like, you know, there's a fake fake thing there's an announcement for a comic fake or not i don't know just a lot of world building you know an indie movie a, a brand of cigarettes you know stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, 
a lot of world building stuff. And in issue two, I had done an ad for a, for a toy, or it was the action figure. It was the big Steel Streets announcement. It comes with includes two weapons. The eyes light up, you know, what, you know stuff like that. And so now it it became a reality, which is <laughs> which is crazy because it went from concept to fake ad to now physical toy. That's uh, that'll be hopefully available. I think in May. I'm gonna start. Oh uh, yes. Of my uh, yeah, out of my publishing house, out of superhero comics, I'm gonna do a little package too. I I started. I made a little. Let's see if I got it right here. I'm gonna have a little little mini comic that's gonna come with the toy and that's you know, awesome. A few little things just to create a nice little experience for for people. But um, that's yeah. gonna be available on your website, or you say at cons or something, or. Uh yeah, I think for now it's gonna be on on the website when I. You know, when I get everything together, I think we'll uh, I'll do a little release and and have that available for people if they they want to get get a little collector's item. You know, sweet dude, that's so sick. Uh, I got a quick question for you, Marty. Actually, you you uh you you have an appearance coming up at a shop, right? A signing, or you just had one? Like, how's how's that been? I just yeah, I just, going? it was amazing. I just did a signing at, at Forbidden Planet. Um, I was the was that uh, your first one? It was my first signing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. That's jumping good. in the deep end, too. It was what? At the Forbidden Planet, I feel like jumping in the deep end. That's a big store. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was wild, yeah. And it, yeah, it was, what was it like? It was amazing. He, um, It was the first time they did an indie uh, creator, like, spotlight type thing. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, so I was the inaugural, inaugural guest with the manager there, um, Matt. He's a great dude he's been you know getting all the books and everything and uh i wanted a signing normally is like a couple hours but i told him i was like, i want to do a shift like you know i want the whole day i want a convention <laughs> i'm ready to work you know <laughs> so that was from one to seven and i had my banner it was like a convention and um and it was amazing i mean it's, it's new york so it was on a saturday so it's a busy day and a bunch of people got the books. Some people brought in their their bootleg Spider Mans to, to have signed. Uh, some people ordered some commissions. Um, it was it was surreal, you know. It felt it felt very much like uh, uh, ah, I, like I did it moment, you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. You know, tourists coming in who don't know me from Adam, is, and they think you know they think I'm somebody, so they want their clothes <laughs> and everything. So they don't know, I'm, you know, I'm just a dude from up the block that's making comics. They're like, oh, this guy, he has this thing. <laughs> so that, that was fantastic yeah that was fantastic oh, that's so cool is that still down the street from the strand there yeah exactly right next door oh i used to work at the strand and i would i would sneak away to go for blood and food and plan oh no way <laughs> it moved cool. like a couple storefronts down or something though from a few years because i just went when i was there too and i was like this seems a little different i think it used to be across the street from the strand oh, yeah. or down the block i don't i don't remember now it's right it's almost right next door yeah oh, excellent. i think there's like a smoke shop separating it or something no. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Rogers time machine still there? Is what? You know, Rogers time machine is that still there? He moved around a lot. I don't. Uh, the last I went, he was he was in the village somewhere. But I think he he moved he moved again. Huh. So he's he's no longer on Fourteenth Street though. That's too bad. That was such a blast there. I, I I was making really bad commercials. Me and James Jean were making Pepsi commercials together for a while in New York. <laughs> Uh, they're on YouTube somewhere, but um, I would I would go to Forbidden Planet on my way to work or on my, my lunch breaks probably, and you have to be or not Forbidden Planet, sorry, to Roger's Time Machine. You have to be buzzed up, and it was like, and and I I would get all the Conan magazines, and the guys would be like arguing about rap music behind the counter, and you go up with a big stack, <laughs> and they would just be like, I don't know, like two bucks, like they just didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> I mean, Roger's great. He yeah, I think the last time I went, he had just moved in. And so he just had boxes and stacks of everything, but he was open. You know, I, I walked in. I said, "So what? Where's the guy?" He's like, hey, "Just look around." And so I just kind of lift these huge posters, and he's like, "Just be careful, you know." And then I ripped some tape back, and he was like, "Ah, why'd you do that?" <laughs> I gotta get new tape. <laughs> it does feel like just going through someone's comic collection. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fun. And I think he moved to online now. Oh, okay. I think yeah, I think he doesn't have a storefront anymore. I, should check I think that. I tried yeah. to go to that one. Was it near Washington Square Park, or something? The, the Rogers Time Machine originally yeah. it was on Fourteenth Street. Oh yeah, uh, I think Dude. above. 
what used to be a, a music store. A word. Right. And then um, and then, he, yeah, I think he was off of Washington Square Park for a little bit, like a place where you go down. Yeah, that's where I went because I was that, like, that was hey, what if there's any comic shops? Yeah, but it wasn't there anymore. Yeah, I th- yeah. That was a, like, recently when you went? Yeah, it was like, like I said, last week, two weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. Oh. And the, well, the other one was um, oh, Jim Hanley's Universe. I remember it was a good yeah. shop. Uh, Jim, no. I was just there earlier today. Nice, yeah. I used to call, they used to have a porn section that we'd call Jim Manley's Handiverse. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, well, I think we're kind of getting toward, oh, Benny, Dr. Yeah. Ben, what up, dude? I wanted to ask uh, Monty there. I, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen your Spider-Man bootleg and everything, and, and I've seen you're doing the uh, Steel, Steel Streets? Yes. I just wanted to he- hear, do you have like a, like an elevator pitch or like, how do you, how do you present that to people? That's, that's what I'm saying. I have no idea what it is besides just hearing about it now and here. So that's some interest in like how you present it to people. Like, do you have like a, you know, like the elevator pitch or just, you know, like if someone comes to the signing, you know, they come up to your table, how do you right. present, you know what I mean? Like just as, you know, I'm saying like, as you're doing, uh, doing the work, you know, that is, that's what we're all here for. <laughs> I think I, I would say what I usually say is uh, Steel Streets is my homage to the comics of the 80s uh, and a, a big riff on the uh, Ninja Turtle saga where I have my own spin. And if you're into amnesiac ninjas who go for blood, then you'll probably like this, uh, this kind of story. Yeah, I need to tweak it a little bit, but <laughs> so I'm just doing that. You know, but I mean, I, you're up to like the sixth issue. So, I mean, it's been, it's been like successful then. Like, you know, like the, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, as every issue I do, I have just the issue before to, to work from and to, and to sell at conventions and everything. So I think by the time I, I don't know, I, I think in my mind, I just had to keep on producing uh, issues to uh, also uh, practice my craft to get better one I was enjoying it a lot and everything so I just um, kept going so whether it was successful or not I think I I, I just kept going because at the beginning I don't think I I sold that many and right. then slowly yeah it's like slowly if, if I if I based uh, whether I would do the issue two on the sales of issue one I would have never done it you know but I just thought to myself I'm just going to do it anyway and I just kept going and going and going and then by issue three uh then things start to pick up because now it's kind of its own, it's a fleshed out world a little bit, more people know about it. And then they go back to issue two and issue one, then issue four, and then they go back three, two, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So I just kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot what I was Did going you have it. other people around you making comics when you when you started doing it? Or did you have to slip um, in line? In my, like, my social circle? Yeah, just like to, to understand like the the process and what tools to use and everything uh, no not really i i kind of i mean the the kayfabe channel was definitely youtube is 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 amazing you know it's like the you know they would talk about a, a type of pin uh, a pen pen nib and i would immediately go to google and go to my art store and be like i, I need a i need to hunt something i need a hunt hunt <laughs> you know? and then the guy would be like uh do you want this i'm like give it to me let's go and i'll go home and try to use it break it go back Try to get another one. Um, but I think slowly, I think I had done maybe six issues of comics before in my first series before I made comic book maker friends, where you know, just maybe cold uh messaging online and then at conventions and then slowly, you know, making friends that way. And then now now I have like we, you know, we got a little crew in New York where we make comics and we, you know, we zoom chat and you know, send each other stuff and everything. But uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of lonely pages before that, you know? and all, and all, and all my friends were musicians too before. So they'd be like, "So, my, were you going to gig tonight?" And I'm like, "Yeah, actually, I'm drawing." Uh, <laughs> yeah, you went from outdoor kids to indoor kids. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. What part of New York are you in again? We got we got our dude Donda asking in the comments. Uh, you're in the city. I'm, yeah, I'm uptown. I'm oh, uptown. Uh, yeah, Harlem. Nice dude. Et. Yeah. Is Dean Haskell still around there? Is he? Oh yeah, for sure. I think he's in. He's in Brooklyn. 
Yeah, yeah. We used to. He used to live across the street from my friend Farrell, and I remember we'd be going out. We'd we'd stay up all night drawing comics, and we'd go out. And Dean would like lean out his window shirtless and be like, "Hey, what are you guys up to? You drawing comics?" Oh no! <laughs> I think he's like as much of a staple there as like the Statue of Liberty. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Dean Dean's a great. I've I've met him on a number of occasions in the in the cons. You know, we always yeah. We, some reason we always talk about Brooklyn. That's kind of the. <laughs> that sounds like two seconds of comic, and then how Brooklyn's changed, and then that's the kind of. <laughs> and uh, Brandon in the comments, Lee's asking about what was it work like to work with James Jean, and I'm asking what can I search on YouTube to watch one of those commercials. <laughs> oh, it's called Pepsi the Canned Caper was the commercial we did together. Uh, I knew James for a while. I so when I moved to New York, it was like '99, and I fell in with a bunch of the SVA guys. <laughs> um, Farrell that I keep mentioning and like Tom Herpick that did a bunch of stuff on Adventure Time and uh, Becky Cloonan that does a bunch of stuff at DC. Uh, Dash Shaw does a bunch of indie comics. We're all kind of this part of this uh, art collective called Meat House. And uh, James was kind of like, like he was already kind of a, you know, he's an art school star. He's like never not drawn a little too good. And uh, and I remember just like, like I liked him and knew he was talented, but until we worked together, I didn't really realize how good he was. And I remember specifically there was one day where he just had a picture of Audrey Hepburn just like taped to a monitor and he was doing like a like a digital painting and just copying the photo exactly and I was like I can't do that I don't know what you're doing you're a monster you should be stopped <laughs> and um yeah I don't know he's, he's one of those I, I not I, I'm trying to word this in a way that doesn't sound bitter about other people he's one of the rare exceptions where he's so talented that he's like undeniable and his success is like of course he's he's so good you know um, I, I, my only wish is that he did more comics. Yeah. And this, this commercial looks like it's a cartoon and it's got Britney Spears in it. It's got Britney Spears in it. Yeah. <laughs> and some so sweet jazz. It was me and a guy named Cassidy did all the animation in it. And then James did all the backgrounds and they're really beautiful backgrounds. And I don't know how to animate. So it's, it's all carried by that. Nice. It's four minutes and 20 seconds. Nice. There's probably some extra Britney Spears nonsense in there, you know, and not just, <laughs> the of, you know, Britney, but <laughs> there's definitely some extra Britney at the end. Did you, did yeah. you meet that, meet her in person? It seems like. No, that. it was a, it was a company called Dogmatic and, and basically their whole, their whole stick was that they would take extra footage from other things and make new things out of it. So they'd be like, we got some clippings of Britney Spears. We can't use you guys do this. And I worked for them for probably off and on for about a year. And uh, and James did some some stuff with them. I think it was right before he started doing Fable covers, and blew up. Oh, nice! Man, you've been around, dude. You seem to have done a ton of shit all over the place. Is there? The <laughs> I got Kanye West stories too. <laughs> a lot of what? I, I said I'll have to tell you guys my Kanye West story sometimes. Oh my god! Is there any other like? project outside of comics like that that you've done that you're like most proud of or something or that we should check out uh i don't know i mean i like comics best and i i feel like there's like i don't know that's a uh i used to really a lot of my it's really funny my um so much of my ego when i was a teenager or when i was in my early 20s was around that i'd done graffiti and it's funny, I've realized recently I've bled that all out of my system and I don't even think of myself as a graffiti writer anymore. Mm. And now I just think of it as like an old man that takes baths, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but there's um, always graffiti in your comics. Like there's never a you know blank wall, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, that was an, that was an interesting conversation early on is the idea of, of my career is the idea of there was, a, there was a weird tenuous thing between graffiti and comics. I mean, Von Baudet, like is kind of where so much of graffiti came from. And then comics it's almost like a one-sided relationship where graffiti loves comics and comics sometimes likes graffiti but it's it's not even you know yeah um yeah i don't know i'm trying to think of what else i've done I, i'm really proud of the adventure time episode i wish i did more of those i only did the one it's called germane was that a show or was that a comic was that a, i mean show. an episode of the actual show yeah it was an episode um oh. uh, me and jesse moya handed it together and he's a fantastic cartoonist wow so like um, your animation, the animation was in your style or was it? The yeah, so, so Adventure Time is a board driven show, which means that the storyboarders do all kind of the writing as well. And then the animators, they send it over to Korea and the animators basically try to stop, stop, sorry, copy the style of your storyboards. So it kind of looks like my art style in the beginning and the end. And it looks like Jesse's work in the middle. Wow. Um, what so episode was that? I'm going to check that out. 
I made mean, a science fiction pilot that I'm trying to figure out how to release that I'm pretty happy with. That's it. Me, and, me and my friend Leroy, who uh, is a porn parody director, <laughs> got together and made a, a weird science fiction thing called The Emperor of the Known Universe. Nice. Uh, starring April O'Neil and Tommy Pistol. And that was really fun. We built a spaceship. Um, yeah. I worked on a bunch of porn parodies, but I don't know if those are <laughs> worth looking at. They're fun. I, I did a John Wick one called John Wank. <laughs> you get to think of the titles because that seems like the second best part. I mean, it's clear what the first best part. Yeah, my friend Leroy is a director in that stuff, and he's a comic guy as well. So we just kind of got along really well, and he started hiring me to fly out to Las Vegas and and work on his movies with him. And and they're a weird kind of porn because they're not really trying to be sexy at all. They're basically like, we'll put a sex scene in here, and then we'll just do a horrible Rugrats movie or something on top of it. <laughs> yeah. I worked on a Lego one where the cum shot is a white Legos. And then at the end they step on them. They're like, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> I think that was the gross idea. Uh, it's amazing. It's a whole art form unto itself, man. Honestly. Yeah. You watch yeah. the Batman 66 one. Oh, is there a Batman 66 one? Yeah. They've got a, in on the, I feel DVD, like the title actually... just Batman 69, right? Oh, good, please. Yeah. Well, it's a Batman porn parody, but they did the, um, the edited out, they edited out all of the porn, and so you can just watch like this weird Batman episode with porn actors. Nice. There's no sex in it. On the I DVD. just, I just actually watched the Pirates movie, which is like the this high budget horrible porn movie. I, it's on YouTube, and I had some friends come over and we just watched it with the sex scenes cut out. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> you talking about the Jenna Jameson one from like way way back in the day, like the huge big budget one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. They made two of them. Yeah, that, that yeah. thing is infamous. Yeah, that thing's crazy. Wow. I've never <laughs> seen it. But, it, yeah, it was, like, advertised all over the place. Yeah, yeah I don't recommend it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Don is asking one more question about your graffiti. He said, what did you write? Did you have I wrote a tag? Brandon because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote Brandon Graham. This is my phone number. Well, I knew a guy. There was a guy named Jabber who was a big graffiti writer in Seattle at the time. And sometimes he would write his real name and mm -hmm. I would be like, aren't you, aren't you worried? And he was like, we're just dumb kids. They can catch us if they want to. It's basically like, <laughs> you don't make yourself. I'm not looking it. through the phone book to see uh, the name. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I guess it didn't. I mean, I never got in that much trouble. So oh, that's awesome. Did we look up Banksy in the phone book? <laughs> <laughs> that's just his real name. John Banksy. Banksy. <laughs> John Banksy. I wanted to try to get into graffiti recently and I, I decided to buy like a big canvas thing and I put it on my wall and I just started kind of doing some some stuff on it. And I took the cans of canvas off and it had bled through to my wall That's right. in, the, in like my studio right here. And then I had a choice to make. So I just kind of kind of went crazy. Oh, nice. Get it going. <laughs> I just, right. Oh, that's awesome. Nice. Kind of decided to go a little crazy. Oh, go back one sec so we can spot that here. Nice, dude. So this this was the graffiti thing I had, that had bled through. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of went for it. Yeah. Nice. I like that even in the spray paint, there's that kind of mirage feel to the like <laughs> watercolor feel. Oh yeah. It's because I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you do it well. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, All that's right, my so we're getting down to the end here. So let's get to uh, some final plugs here. Um, Maddie and Brandon, let's tell us where we can find more of your stuff, what you got coming out and where we can, uh, how we can support you. Maddie, we'll start with you. Yeah. I got Steel Streets uh, 6 out now. Uh, you can get them at superherocomics.com. Um, or I think if you request it at your local comic shop, I'm sure they can, they can order it from the publisher. Um, I'm going to do Wicked Con this weekend uh, in Boston. If anyone's there, I'll be I'll be hanging out. And uh, I got invited to do uh, Indie Island this year at Heroes Con, which is pretty pretty awesome. So I'll be there as well. But otherwise, it's Steel Streets. If you go to SuperhereoComics.com, you can find all my other books, uh, the one shots, the mini comics, uh, the other series, and, uh, and yeah, that's what that's what I'm doing right now. So. Nice, dude. I will see you at Heroes Con. Then let's grab. Oh, of course, absolutely. Hell yeah! All right, Brandon. What about you? Uh, so I, I post on Instagram mostly. Uh, just Royal Brandon. 
and uh, I have a Patreon that's linked off of that. And uh, I've got a new, I've got, I've got a new book that should be out in October that I'm going to announce really soon. That I'm really excited by. And I guess my last book is right my cameras. I've got my art book here called Royal Boiler. And then uh, King City that, and Profit, all the stuff that you can bug your local comic store to find. But yeah, thanks so much for having me on, guys. It's really fun. Absolutely, man. Dude, your other art book like went crazy price-wise. It's like- Oh, Walrus. I got a copy of that. Yeah, actually. Walrus, yeah. Walrus just, I, I keep thinking about reprinting it, but I have a lot of, me and my ex-wife did a bunch of stuff in there and I almost feel like it's a little rude to include her in my career if we're not together anymore. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, it's a great book. I mean, they're both great. Uh, but I was, it's like that one. And and the same with Maddie's or with Maddie's uh, bootleg Spidey. Like it's on eBay for like, I'm seeing it for like 90 buy it now and shit. Oh yeah. Oh, crazy. Shocking. oh yeah. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> All right. Cool. And um, uh, let's go around to our host, Manny. Where can we find you as well? Well, you can read, uh, well, you can find me on Instagram under um, underscore. I'd buy that for a dollar underscore. I'm always posting, uh, you know, comic book pictures, a lot of dollar bin books. That's kind of my, my one of my big hobbies. Uh, you can watch me on the Comics Lounge every week doing uh, weekly comic picks and, uh, you know, a couple of interviews and a couple of spotlights on, you know, certain uh, issues and arcs. You can read uh, my column, um, Self-Published Spotlight on monkeysfightingrobots.com. I've interviewed a bunch of you guys already on there. So, uh, and I'm going to continue to do so. Usually pumping out about an interview every couple of weeks or so. And uh, you can find me reviewing comics, uh, the uh, indie comics for the Comics Beat every Wednesday. And uh, I'm also working on Relic Hunter uh, issue two with Adam down there. And uh, Rick and I have a short story uh, in uh, issue one that'll be as a backup. So that'll be out sometime this year. So yeah, that's what I got going on. Trying to stay busy. Hell yeah. What about you, Rick? Where can we find you? uh find me at instagram at doom dazed um follow next panel press there's over a dozen of us we put out new comics every sunday there's alternating groups between each weekend um and you can read each of our uh, you could binge each of our series in the story highlights like this weekend i'm about to put out the 57th strip and you could read you could read start from one and get all the way through that tonight if you want and binge to the rest of them as well I'm at the very end of the colors for that Relic Hunter story. Like I'm on this, finishing up this double page spread. I'm like on the very last, hopefully I should finish it tonight. And then I'm starting back colors for the third, third issue in my series, The Power. It's a, it's a four issue series about a boy creating a comic only to discover a realm beyond space and time within his own mind. So make sure to check that out and follow along. Hell yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you, Marty. Appreciate your time yeah, so thanks, much. Guys. Thank you. All right. And you can find my stuff on cosmiclionproductions.com. We've got a whole family of books up there, including The Ghost Agent's Treasury, Space Knights, Tales from the Wolf, the upcoming, as, as previously spoken about, Relic Hunter uh, by Adam down there. Uh, we've got uh, Barry Tan's contraband comic cavalcade, which is uh, his uh, image comics spoof. And of course it's printed on uh, hollow foil paper. You can grab that right now. Look at that, Brandon. Oh, I know that guy. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Barry is a fucking beast. That's really cool. Um, what else do we have? You know, I found a copy of wizard one. I have two of those left. If someone's interested in, um paying for that is that one of spider-man dressed as a wizard or the wizard one <laughs> well no nah, this one is was uh that one, that one's the, great. Um, one of mine uh the uh, david brower's uh x-men uh riff so we got that one i got two of those arcane issue three just came out that finishes off the first um the first book of that about a young boy who finds the oculus that allows him to see the terror that lies directly under the surface. Um, and that's it. CosmicLionProductions.com or at Cosmic Lion on, uh, on uh, the Instamograms. Um, 
and that's about it. Um, Adam, do you want to say anything? You want to have a you have a exclusive about your book <laughs> that we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, I'm super stoked, man. Uh, putting it out through Cosmic Lion. Um, it should be out. Uh, fingers crossed by um by Heroes Con. So uh, it should be there. It should be for sale. Um, I've got. Uh, it's going to be a deluxe magazine sized, uh, much like your Conan magazine. Yeah, it's, going to yeah, have it's my, it, if you don't know what it is, it's my uh, homage to the Savage Sword of Conan, to D&D fantasy art and fan art, to heavy metal album covers, uh, Jim Starlin, you know, like all that kind of like outer space acid trip barbarian craziness. And uh it turned out amazing. I've got Kevin Catalan uh, did the back cover. It looks amazing. Misimo's doing the colors for the cover. Uh, they look incredible. I've got a million awesome pinups inside. Alex Delaney, Ken Landgraf, uh, Craig CK, um, who will all his pinup will also be available as a full color poster um, and. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> it's yeah. I'm super excited. And you can follow me at uh at Adam Lemna on Instagram and uh you can see Relic Hunter uh on Next Panel Press. Uh and I'm doing uh issue two right now. Um issue one is sort of like the start of the story, and then issue two um takes place in New York City in 1984. So it's uh it it crosses through time and space. It's funny. <laughs> Hell yeah. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, that's gonna be safe Thanks, and also available on cosmicclientproductions.com. Yeah, man. Dr. B, what about you? Where can we find you, man? Uh drben.substack.com is where uh I'm doing relaunch. I got where's that? Oh, and my uh me doing the second issue this is this is just like the you call it the uh ash can this is like the ash can of like the first one that i'd already done because i sold all the old ones and uh and then my youtube channel is what dr ben thick comics i don't even know what it is <laughs> just search that on youtube yeah and we're gonna be covering on it. uh nice phantom stranger Ooh, nice yeah, what is this? Ninety three, like the one shot from Vertigo. Nice. Me and my buddy Sam will be covering it tomorrow. I don't know what time it's. You know, it's. I mean, it's the holiday, but you know, we're gonna. <laughs> we, work, we work through the holidays, regardless. You know, so. <laughs> it's a big holiday tomorrow. Yeah, I'm Can't thinking. Remember for what though? Damn it. Yeah. Um, what what could it be? <laughs> <laughs> Too much ganja. Anyway, all right. Thanks, Doctor B. Oh, yeah. uh, what about you, Matt? You want to do a plug? Or are you are you uh, set to chill in the um, shadows? I'll ask to unmute you. You don't have to. You got a good book, though. Oh, man. Thank you. Um, you follow me at uh, Tales to Enlighten on Instagram or uh, my personal Instagram, King Megatrip 23 where I post uh, panels from what I'm reading. Uh, KingMegatrip.etsy.com to buy the book. Uh, thanks very much, Brandon. Thanks very much, Marty. Dude, this was cool. Oh, yeah. Thanks for joining I'll, us, I'll, y'all. I'll have to swing by. I'll have to swing by and see Marty on uh, WikiCon on Saturday. Are you gonna Sick, be there? Dude. Yeah, I'll be there. Nice. All right, man. Thank you. Yeah, cool. All right, y'all. And as we end every episode, don't just read more comics. Be more, be more comics. comics. Oh wait, comics. we got Beverly too. Unless. If, unless Beverly wants to do a, um, a plug, I'll ask to unmute. Hello. <laughs> what up? Um, I don't make comics yet. Um, I'm just an artist. <laughs> um, but you can find me at Beverly Salas. <laughs> On Instagram? Yes. All right. Well, you got you just met a bunch of cartoonists today. So if you have any questions, <laughs> reach out. Definitely will. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Again, uh, don't just read more comics, be more comics until next month. All right, y'all.